who you are, what you do, what you're passionate about. Okay. Can we start there? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm a teacher. Uh, I'm a principal. I'm a school psychologist. Uh, I'm passionate about kids learning. So I did a lot of work with kids who were at risk uh, in school. And uh, that led me to finally figure out that the public school system was not going to do it. And if we really wanted to get it done right, we were going to have to go into the world of private enterprise. And so I left education and chose to open my own learning center. And uh, that was 1979. What were some of the problems with the public education sector? Well, they're not responsive and they're not accountable. You know, well, they, uh, they're perfectly happy to see one third of the kids not do well. And they essentially then stick a label on them and blame the child or blame the family or blame the culture or whatever it is. But it's never the teaching that's at fault. It's always something else. And as a result, of course, these kids get passed through and they don't necessarily become competent. And as I've always said, we're just creating our next generation of welfare cases. It means you tip into like, this public education is not going to work anymore. Well, it, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's a, a somewhat longer story. Basically, when I finished uh, my bachelor's degree, I decided to become a teacher and I went and got trained and went to work for what I thought were going to be the best teachers in the world, the Jesuits. They were notorious as teachers. And I had a classroom of kids that I was teaching uh, geography and history too, and those kids didn't need me any more than they needed two heads because they were all very smart and they were all very rich. And, and basically what it turned out to tell me was that the Jesuits were really good at cherry picking. These were, this was a private school, big tuition fees, only rich kids you know, were as, literally accepted. And uh, so teaching was easy because these kids had everything but attitude, right? Mm -hmm. And so I left that after a year. Uh, there was no challenge there. And I walked up the street to the next school. And the next high school was the toughest high school in town. And it was the, uh, the middle 60s and the baby boomers were headed into high school. And my first class had 42 kids in it. And they were all males and they were all uh, science and tech. I mean, they were not academic students. They were the bottom of the barrel. And they were proud of their ability to drive teachers crazy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I had them back to back for two 45 minute periods at the end of each day to teach them their two favorite subjects, history and geography. And so obviously I would be perfectly set up for, for being one of those teachers who got mauled. Uh, but I was also their football coach. Okay. So, uh, we would practice after school every day. And one day I had this big Dutch kid and I said to him, uh, you know, you get your, you got all your weight on your hand. Somebody's gonna break your arm. I was teaching him a three point stance and he got snarly. And I didn't, I wasn't in gear, he was. I said, okay, I'm, I'm going after your quarterback, you stop me. And I knocked him down three times. And each time he got up, he said, he'd have some kind of complaint, right? And then I said, okay, come and get my quarterback. And he tried and I knocked him on his ass three more times. And basically he said, okay, so what am I supposed to do? I said, okay, good. Now you're ready to learn. And I showed him how, well, from that point on, he became my protector. <laughs> no kid at school would even think about doing anything to me because they'd have to deal with him, right? And uh, so I had no discipline problems in that sense. I was not a great teacher at that point because I didn't know how to teach. I wasn't trained properly like anybody else. I, I feel sorry for the teachers because we do not prepare them. Uh, we do not teach them the skills they need to survive and prosper in a classroom. And finally, I just left. Yeah. Let's talk about those skills. What's not taught and where did you go to? Well, I, I went to, uh, in Ontario, there was only one, it's a provincial program for uh, you know, licensing teachers. And I went to that and uh, Basically, they, I tell people what I learned in my teacher training and for that matter in my uh, principal's training, I can put into a thimble and still put my finger in it. 
So they didn't teach us things about classroom management. How do you keep these kids under instructional control? No idea. They didn't teach us about how do you instruct? You know, how do you know if this is working? It was all people coming in nattering at us about something that was topical and uh, then leaving you to go figure out how to do it. And, you know, that just doesn't work. Uh, and they're still doing it today. Our teachers are no better trained today than they were when I started almost 50 years ago. It's crazy. It is crazy. And it's particularly crazy now that we know what's possible. You know, if there had never been a project follow through where 16 different methods of instruction got tested head to head over a long period of time with like a half a million kids at a cost of, you know, 1.2 billion US dollars, we would maybe have an excuse for not knowing. But the fact of the matter is that research was done, it was replicated, it consistently came out the same way, and uh, the education community basically ignored it. The teachers' colleges had wanted nothing to do with it. And so follow through became a, a very expensive program that was never ever utilized. And I happened to pick up on the methods that worked. So follow through is an interesting, like a fascinating topic for those same reasons I share that. Like a one, I usually talk about as a billion plus dollar study yeah. that showed us what works and then we did nothing with that, right? It's were worse. You, were yeah. You, yeah, were, were you in any way involved with, or like around the culture? That was yeah, like absolutely I was. What yeah, was it, like? it was wonderful. Uh, I was a graduate student at the time when follow through started, uh, but I became involved with it later. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the study was still ongoing, uh, but uh, m at that point, much of the research was already in and we already knew what worked. And I ran into the follow through study because I came back to education uh, after my graduate work and was hired by a school, by a school district to uh, scrape kids off the wall. I was the, the behavior analyst, right? I was the guy who was gonna get these kids under control. And uh, so I started with my behavioral technology, working in classrooms, teaching teachers how to manage classrooms. Well, most of that's kind of duck soup, right? But occasionally you run into a, a challenge and, and that happens. So, uh, I got to follow through because I ran into a very difficult student uh, who showed me that behavior analysis is not a sufficient solution to having children learn and be fluent and be adept at, at doing almost anything. So, so what are those practices then? Well, uh, Let's take this, this child as a case study. He was uh, 12 years old, he was in grade seven, uh, couldn't read a word. So he would do anything else and he would get kicked out of class and he'd be in the principal's office and then he'd wander down the halls and violate the principal's rule and then he mom would get called and, and come, told to come and pick him up and he'd go home and you know he'd get into trouble on the bus or he'd get into trouble on the recess uh, period or in the cafeteria or wherever, right? He's just, just a little hell raiser. And uh, so the principal called me and said, can, can you help us? And I said, well, yeah, but here's the deal. You have to give me one hour of your time to teach the teacher how to do classroom management because I'm not just gonna come in and put a patch on this. I wanna teach that teacher how to manage her classroom, his or her classroom uh, after I'm gone. So he, he made the deal with me. And, and so I would go in once a week for a half a day and work with this teacher. and. Uh, I sat in the back of the classroom and I watched this young man and he, he was just all over the place. And after about 10 minutes, he'd be thrown out. He couldn't, he couldn't handle any period longer than about 10 minutes. And so uh, I went to the journals and found an article actually written uh, by a guy named Edward Kubani at the University of Hawaii. And it was called the Good Behavior Clock. And in the Good Behavior Clock, it's a random clock setting and all the teacher has to do when the bell goes ding is to turn and look at the child, say you're on task or you're off task and award points for that, which the whole class shared in. 
So the beauty of having the whole class share in it is they got to pick what the reinforcers were going to be as a group. They got to encourage him to get out of trouble or stay out of trouble and to do well. And so he turned on a dime and became the model student because he was the king of the castle, right? He was the only one who could win the, the pizza party. Well, everyone was just very shocked, right? And uh, three weeks later, I'm in the classroom and I walk down between the desks and he's sitting there and they're 10 minutes into a, uh, into a seat work exercise doing word problems in math. And his scribbler's open, his textbook's open, he's got his pencil in his hand, he's looking every inch a student. And I look down at his paper and there's not a mark on the sheet. And I said to him, is this hard? And he looked at me and said, yeah, yeah it is. I said, well, what's hard about it? He said, well, some of the words. I said, well, read, you know, point them out to me. I'll read them to you. And he looked up at me with his big brown eyes and he says, it's all of them. And I thought, oh, nice going, Mr. Behavior Analyst. Like, whose problem did you solve? Teacher's happy. Principal's happy. Mom's happy. The bus driver's happy. The only kid who isn't getting anything out of this is him. I've turned him into a dead man. I thought, well done, idiot. I kind of took myself for a walk and said, let's back up the bus and find out why this didn't work. So that's when I drove down to the university again, get into the stacks and found the follow through project. Well, there it is, big as life. There's direct instruction accounting for 75% of the variance. First in reading, first in math, first in spelling, first in language, first in all the way down the list. First and first and first, right? Uh, okay, so I got on a plane, I flew it to Eugene, Oregon. I walked into Zig Engelman's office and I said, hi, I'm Michael Maloney, I'm from Ontario. And uh, I know you know how to teach kids and I need you to teach me. And he said, uh, third door on the right, her name is Linda. And that was Linda Garcia. Uh, and Linda taught me to be a really good direct instruction teacher and trainer. So then I went back into that classroom and many others and set up direct instruction programs. Brought Zig in from Oregon a couple of times uh, for a week to work with us. Got hired Linda Olin, Linda Garcia, full time. She came and worked with us. And we just, things were just burning. We were having way too much fun. So you, you, you didn't even contact, write a letter beforehand. You just showed up and knocked on his door. And you, yeah. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> What's your point? <laughs> it's that go-get them attitude. Well, if, if, life is short. Yeah. You know, get on with it. What was uh, what was Zig like? Crusty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, incredibly smart. Genius. Yeah. Uh, difficult. Uh, so some would say he had no social graces. Like a stubborn sort of. Oh, more than stubborn. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He, he. I've been. You know, the the butt of his anger more than once. Okay. But he also respect. It wasn't out of disrespect. It was just he's impatient. Yeah. Right. So, and I guess when you're that, when you're as insightful and smart as he is or was, you know, that may happen to you. Yeah. It wasn't arrogance. Uh, and it wasn't ego. It was just zig. Right? Yeah. And so uh, he and I got to be fairly close for a period of years. And then I gradually, we gradually saw less and less of one another, being 5,000 miles apart. But uh, yeah, he's an amazing, was an amazing man. And his work will be around for a very long time. Yeah. So um, let's set context for people real quick and describe direct instruction, what it looks like a little bit. Well, direct instruction is where you take a, a body of knowledge and you look through it, you sort it out, and you see if there are any rules that apply to all or most of it. And then you extract those rules and you teach the rule to the child or to the student, whether they're a child or adult. And then you, you uh, once they know what the rule is, then you teach them examples of the rule and you teach them non-examples of the rule so they can see how, when the rule applies, when it does not apply. And then you mix them up. You put examples and non-examples into the same task and they have to use their knowledge of the rule to discriminate which one is this. Is this, is this an example or is this not a non-example? So, you know, in reading, there's uh, sometimes an E at the end of the word. Almost always an E at the end of the word makes the vowel in front of it say its name. 
So you have cop and you have cope. Well, when I teach that to kids, first of all, I teach them the rule. E at the end of the word makes the vowel say its name. And I make them say that verbatim until they can do it, you know, exactly and correctly. And then we simply put up a list of non-examples and I have them read them. Then I'll add an E to each of them, have them repeat the rule, have them read the list. Now they're all examples. And what we're doing there is the minimal discrimination between an example and a non-example. So this is where the rule works. This is where the rule doesn't work. And once they've got that down, then you wipe randomly wipe out half of the E's. And now we force them to discriminate using the rule, which is this? Is this an example of the rule or is this a non-example? And you can do that with all manner of discriminations in learning because things are either A or sometimes they're B and sometimes they're more than that because there are some words out there that it doesn't apply to. So those exceptions, we'll have to teach them as well. Mm -hmm. But when you organize learning in that way, the kids get it because it's very clear. It's, it's, they've got a rule to work with. They can use the rule to, to discriminate and they can get it right. There, you described yourself like it's, it's been 45 years. Yeah. You've known this. Um, <laughs> what, what keeps it going? Like what keeps? Well, we're not done yet. Yeah. You know, there's 25% of North Americans can't read. Mm -hmm. That hasn't changed in decades. In fact, I doubt that it's changed in the last 100 years. We just didn't measure it before then. Okay. Back in an industrial age society, you could drop out of school, get a job at a factory, work all your life, pr make a good living, have a family, do all of those things, and not be able to read. Well, with automation and the use of systems, mm -hmm that require literacy, all of that went out the window. And now the people who can't read can't get the kinds of jobs that were there. Those jobs are all automated now, they're gone. And they're never coming back. So at some point we figured out that about 25% of North Americans can't read, uh, probably sometime in the 40s or 50s. But it hasn't changed in all that time. And it's, it's not about to because our schools are not accountable to produce learners. They're accountable to stay within the budget set by the state or the, the district, you know, so they don't have to raise the levy on, on homes again. They're, that's more important to most administrators than learning and kids. So. Why do you think that is? Because like, I, mean, I don't think that those people are going to that role because that's, like, I think they have a, a goal of improving education. Right? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they, uh, no the question. System, They're not malicious. Yeah, it's just the system is that ill-designed. Yes, it, it is. Influence that sort of behavior. Yes, it is. Yeah. And, and that happened gradually. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in the 1940s and early 50s, schools were really community settings. You know, there'd be a, the, the one-room schoolhouse or the very small schoolhouse. And, and it was run locally by people from the community. Well, then as the baby boom emerged, uh, the schools became bigger and they got amalgamated and they, the community content became, you know, somewhat dissolved or diluted. And then they formed districts and it got even bigger and less personal and less in the hands of the people whose children were in the schools and more in the hands of administrators and, you know, and policy people. And that then moved to the state level as the state took over responsibility for education. And then again, with special ed, in comes the feds. And with the feds come all of the rules that you need in order to do this, that, and the other. Well, as the, the giant mammoth grew, it became less and less responsive to the needs of any particular child or community. And so that's what we've got now. We've got this humongous I mean, seven or eight percent of the GDP is spent on education, and we still have twenty-five percent of the kids who can't read. Give me a break, right? And we know what the solution is, but we don't use it. Why is that? We don't have to. It's just not incentivized. Yeah. It's not incentivized. First of all, sixty-five percent of the kids are going to do just fine. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We can run this country on sixty-five percent knowledge base. 35% of the kids are going to come the next generation of 
prisoners, welfare clients, uh, foster kids, whatever, and they provide a lot of jobs. That's a little cynical, but I'm sorry. Uh, make me a liar, right? And the bottom line is that the schools are, if you ran a company the way you ran a school, you'd be bankrupt in six months. You'd be out of business because the natural laws of business would come and get you, it would eat your heart out. Right? But schools don't have those contingencies. They don't have to produce a product. They don't have to deliver on time. They don't have to meet standards. And then, you know, you get all of the other things, the unions, right, that have their own agenda and their own power base and all of that. So the janitors go on strike. Now they can't close the school. They can't open the school because of fire code or sanitary hygiene, health regulations or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So there's just so many players and so many agendas. Uh, so what's the alternative? Like you said, you're optimistic. I am optimistic. Uh, well, you got to you've got to look at the alternative for the kids who need it. And say, sixty five percent of the kids will do just fine. Thank you very much. They, they don't really need any more than they've got now. But that's not our problem. The problem is the thirty five percent who don't get that opportunity. Maybe they're poor. Maybe they're rural. Maybe they're second language English. Maybe they're an immigrant. Maybe they're a refugee. You know, you've got to allow for uh, the, all of the people that are in the system to have an equal opportunity to take advantage of the system. And when you don't do that, you're just inviting disaster for these kids who are at risk. And uh, from where I sit, uh, you have to get the fundamentals down. You have to teach kids how to read. You have to teach them how to write and spell and do math. And if you don't do that, all the rest becomes pretty much you know, irrelevant. And we're not doing a good job of that. And more particularly, we are not training our teachers in a way in which they can do a good job. We've handcuffed them. So uh, it's fixable. The technology's there. I've been using it for 40 years. I've had a hand in remediating 100,000 kids. So it's not, like, you know, it's not like it's unable to be done. It's so we have to decide to go do it and to hold somebody accountable for it. Yeah. It sounds like, uh, it gets me thinking like until shit's bad enough um, and some sort of large event like that happens, like, yeah. why would we select, right? Culturally. We don't need to. Yeah, exactly. That's sad, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that event probably will happen uh, because if you abuse systems long enough and well enough, there will be consequences. Yeah. And some of those consequences can be pretty dark. So if we start having, you know, riots in the streets and gangs and upheaval, socially based on poverty because we can't get a job because we can't fill out the forms and we can't get trained. And if it scales up to something like that, that could be the, yeah. the event that would kick it off and get some kind of change to happen. I think part of that though is like, do people even know there's an alternative out there? Right? <laughs> they don't. Uh, no, they don't know there's an alternative. Uh, that's, that's one of the unfortunate things about the situation is that people kind of think, well, we've got a school system. It's the only one we got. We got to do it. Or I guess for some people, if they're sufficiently, uh, well healed, they can pick a private school or they can, if they're, uh, very opposed to public school education, they can start a home schooling project for themselves and remove their children. And there, there are a couple of million homeschoolers out there. So that's a movement. Uh, we have to be able to, in one way or another, we need to find a mechanism to be able to hold a school accountable. And uh, no one's done that yet. But as soon as, as soon as that is in place, then the schools will actually run in the direction of all of our science 
that we have as, as behavioral analysts. Uh, and they will be clamoring for it because they know it works or they'll f quickly find out that this is how you do it. Uh, and that's been proven way too many times. You know, uh, there is a situation that I was in with my colleagues where we actually got let go by the school system because we embarrassed them by taking children who had been failing and turning them into really good rock hard students, so much so that they were better than their grade five sibling. And the parents kept coming into the school saying, I'd like to transfer my grade five kid into special ed. And the principal would say, well, why do you want to do that? Because my special ed kid can read, write, spell, and do better than math than my reading, all of those better than my grade five kid. So why can't I do that? Well, that went down well about twice. And from that point on, it became very clear that this was no longer funny. This was something that was going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. And so very simply, they fired Linda, they fired Linda, they let me go, they let Eric go, right? Because the teachers, the other teachers, didn't want to commit to that level of effort and and uh, you know that level of accountability, uh, and so the system just basically killed it. So it seems like we're back to the point now where like these in, these effective things uh, aren't accepted, right? By these never happen. Can be found a way in which you can implement these without getting kicked out for doing so damn well. Because <laughs> like my first thought is, is <laughs> like you, you, you're too effective. So maybe you're like, be a little less effective, but that's messed up for the students. No, you right? can't do that to the kids. Yeah. So like, I mean, do you still get kicked out of schools or have you found a way that? Well, no, I haven't because I went and started my own. And uh, if you uh, went out to Wilmington, North Carolina and talked to Baker Mitchell, you could see a really good example of how we could revamp education. Now, charter schools, as most people know, uh, are usually uh, founded in areas of the country where there's less wealth and where the kids are either rural or sometimes poor. And, and the charter school is typically started either by a church or a university or some nonprofit agency and they qualify for funding and they get funding from the state and they are in fact a public school. They have to take every student until they're full. Right? And uh, so the thing about it is that they also have to have a, an organizer and that organizer typically is a university or a church or a college or something. And they skim about 15% of the fees right off the top for administration. Well, that means that the charter schools are working on 85% of the budget that a typical public school in a district would get. And so uh, they're doing more with less. But Baker Mitchell uh, decided that he was going to build the world's best school. And he was uh, fortunately uh, very well healed. He had made tons of money and he was going to invest it in kids. And so he bought a, a, a park that, that had been a uh, trailer camp, trailer park, and took all the pads and gradually turned each one of them into a classroom and each year he would add a grade. And uh, before long he had more kids than he could possibly handle. So he built a second charter school and then a third one and then a fourth one. And now he's got something in the order of like 2,000 kids coming to school. And they, they are using direct instruction. They're using a, a precision teaching. His behavior management is rock solid. Uh, the kids are taking things like Latin. <laughs> uh, he's got absolutely wonderful uh, environment and, and climate that these kids work in. Uh, he, he brooks no insolence. He has no time for, for fools. Uh, his teachers work very hard. Mm -hmm. uh, I've helped train them and, and they're delightful. But uh, Baker is getting results consistently. He leads the state uh, every year uh, with his schools. 
Well, we so, could, at that, so at that point, though, do you now start to make other schools and districts look bad? Maybe yes. You run into the same problem that you ran into the high school. Or it's possible. You ran into the class level. Well, then let's flip them. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't want to do the job and get it right, go ahead, leave. We'll find. We'll we'll set it up so that the students can migrate. Mm -hmm. Let's make it a case where people can vote with their feet. You know, you you don't want to go to the public school. Well, we happen to have a charter school that's setting up right next door, and uh, you and your children can be associated with that. It's no tuition, right? And it's a public school, and let's just run it head to head and see who wins. So you, you see that as a way in which these charter schools could be the avenue for sure, like if somebody's looking to... If they do it in the way in which Baker Mitchell does it. Okay. But not if they run it the way many char charter schools are run. They're just a knockoff of the public school because the people running them don't have access to our science and to what we could bring to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, and so consequently, they're, they're just kind of taking whatever they think is going to work. They're, and... It may or may not be better. I don't know. I've seen good charter schools and I've seen horrible ones. Yeah. So the secret is in the science. So one way or another, whether it's in a school or outside of a school, we need to get what we know in front of these kids and teachers. And it's you know, Engelman, Skinner, uh, Lindsley, Fred Keller, all of them, and there are a number of others out there who have made giant contributions to the knowledge base that we could share with parents and kids and teachers. Yeah. But we're not really good at that, right? Okay. I mean, basically, uh, you can take direct instruction, precision teaching, behavior analysis, you can take those beautiful systems and you can take them out there into the public world. And if this revolution happened and all of a sudden there's a huge need and a huge desire, a huge demand for these things, what are we going to do then? Because we can only train so many people at yeah, one okay. time. So what are, we, what are we equipped for then? You say we're equipped. Um... Well, it depends on how we do it. Okay. One of the problems we're, we have now is if people want the the skill sets that we can provide them with direct instruction, precision teaching, behavior analysis, mm -hmm. then there aren't enough people out there available to render that service well. Mm -hmm. And so consequently, the kind of scenario that you saw could erupt again, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are, the other alternative to that is to put it online. Okay. So that the person can, A, see it, Make sure it's well done to start with yeah. before you put it up there. For sure, yeah. But then, uh, you know, they can see it. They can, they can review it as many times as they need to, not just me being here for three days or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then they can practice. And then we could also set up standards that says, before you do try this at home, make sure you can do this. Mm -hmm. This is your, you know, bottom line, baseline for application. See, I think about this sometimes because there is uh, some conferences. They call it the Drake Conferences, I believe, mm -hmm. at the University in like the seventies. There's a couple books that came out of it, and my understanding was that I think it was Don Bear. I can't remember. It was the Kansas Crew. I just don't remember mm -hmm. at what time and like who exactly was on this paper. We're talking about uh, should we? It was around certification discussion. So we're yeah. certifying people or should we be certifying procedures? And what I feel like um, when I read that, I was like, we went with the certifying people route, right? Saying yep. you were now certified or licensed to do whatever. Mm -hmm. But what if we had gone that route of certifying procedures? Because it sounds like what you're talking about, you can't yeah. demonstrate that you do these sort of things. Well, if you get sick and get taken into a hospital mm -hmm. and you have to have a, an appendix removed, it doesn't matter much which hospital you wind up at or which surgeon shows up at the side of the table. The procedures are pretty much standardized. Mm -hmm. And in medicine, especially, they tend to have procedures which they adhere to. And when they improve them, they pass those improvements on yeah. to other, other doctors. And they have a system by which they implement much of the discovery that the research renders. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it's the procedures that we need to really concentrate on. The people come and go. Yeah. The people are, some of them are very good, some of them are mediocre, some of them are bloody awful, right? And so let's not go that route. Uh, and I don't care much about who you are. I care a whole lot more about what can you show me. Like, I ran my learning center for 45 years. I never once interviewed anybody for a job. I held a lot of training sessions, free. And I would pick the cream of the crop of the, those who could actually go through the training with me and demonstrate to me that they could put 20 dots on a chart or blend words or, you know, keep a student under control. Mm -hmm. And you know, the rest just didn't get hired. Yeah. See, I see the, uh, I see the trends of like a, I, I have no clue what the actual data are on this, but when you look at things like uh, a Coursera or these these movements that are about supposedly about like kind of micro credentialing, like you have these little certificates or things mm -hmm. that you've gone through, right? It makes me think that um, there could be a good possibility of something that was out there that taught people this is a skill that you need to have when you can do this sort of skill. You're now allowed to do this. It's a, but the thing is, it's such a different certification process, right? Well, it's not cert let's not certify them. Yeah. Let's measure their performance and go with that. Yeah. You know, if you can do this, like tie a knot inside a, a, a chest of a heart patient with your right hand and do it in less than X seconds mm -hmm. uh, as a surgeon, which you have to be able to do, well, then you can be certified. But until you can do that with this dummy and this piece of string, mm -hmm. you know, you're not ready. Yeah. And your patients don't need you in the operating room. Yeah. So let's, let's set the standards that are completely measurable and then strive to, to develop the, the learner into doing that. But that, that also Im implies that you have a, an instructional system that's going to get you there. Uh, for education, we're very fortunate because Zig left lots and lots of programs out there for teaching fundamental skills to kids. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure what exists in other portions of the of the professional world. Right. I'm also uh, it reminds me of uh, there's a book by who is it? Oh my gosh, I can see the. I can see the entire cover. Um, I know Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, was part of it. It was a study called Case 2. Uh, the first one was Case. Case 2 was the second iteration. Um, the first was a pilot, which then got them this, this funding. And they were working in Washington, D.C. in like 70, 71, 70. Or it was probably very late 60s because they wrote and published the book in like 71 or 72. Mm -hmm. It was off of that. And it was a... It was a one-year study uh, looking at um, could they take uh, people that were in uh, juvenile prison prison system mm -hmm. um, locked up. I remember a couple of them had committed things like auto theft, grand theft, or and I think there was uh, just assault charges and things mm -hmm. like that. But it was it was enough to where you were locked up full time in this system. They developed an, an entire course of uh, PSI. Mm -hmm. for all of high school, the entirety of high school uh, curriculum. And it was a level system, essentially, designed to where as you worked and uh, learned more skills, you were provided more freedoms yep. within, the, within there. Uh, one of those levels was you were actually allowed to exit, like one of the top levels, right, was you were allowed to check out of the system, go out into the community for a weekend, and go yeah. back. And yeah. So you had to self check in, right? Back into prison, sure. Which people would not even imagine as like uh, an acceptable sort of thing, and like it's there's a disconnect there as to like why that's why that's something you try out for most people. But um, when I remember reading that, and I was like, they developed an entire like it was like a couple lines. It was like so then we developed precise system instruction for grades nine through twelve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like you develop a precise system of instruction for people nine through twelve. Like that, that's probably a where did that go, right? Like, where is that? Like, who knows? Had all of that? Yeah. Like Computer-based uh, system, right? Or not computer-based, like a... Paper-based. Paper-based anyway. system. Mm -hmm. 
uh, for grades nine through twelve. That's easy. Yeah. That's easy. We, we've we've done. People are starving for that sort of stuff now. I don't. Like I'm not sure they are. No. I'm not sure they are. Uh, we worked, uh, did a lot of work with injured workers. Okay. And these are mostly construction guys, and truck drivers, and things like that. And they rolled the rig, and they now have three vertebrae in their back that are fused together, and mm -hmm. they're never getting up in that cab again. But they're illiterate. And the Workers' Compensation Board in Ontario and Canada has to pay that worker 85% of his pre-injury earnings for as long as he's injured or until you can get him another equivalent paying job. Well, you can imagine the cost. Yeah. So they would send them to us and we would teach them to become literate. And while we were doing that, we would then enroll them in high school courses uh, for the number of credits they still required in order to get a certificate, an Ontario yeah. Secondary School diploma, and then we would send them off to college. We never had students that were there for more than 12 months, and they came in literally unable to read a word. And within 12 months, we would have them literate, have their courses for secondary school completed and have them accepted by a community college into mostly technical programs like chemical engineering assistant or things like that. Yeah. And we tracked those kids, those students, and 92% of them survived the first semester of college. And the school system only had a 65% able to do that. So we have that technology, it's there, it's alive, it's well. Uh, and once you get these guys, and some few ladies that were among them, uh, once you get these people launched, they just, they just, they're unstoppable. They flourish, yeah. yeah, they flourish, and, and they're hungry. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we were highly successful with that uh, on, you know, for a number of years. So if, if uh... I feel like a lot of analysts, a lot of people out there, especially at this point, would probably be like, okay, like, how do I do this? Like, this, this seems like a very daunting task. Like, it's not. It's not. So can you just lay out, like, oh, how, sure. like if someone wants to implement this tomorrow? Yeah, they, they, first of all, they're going to go uh, do the quick assessment on these guys. And then you'll find out when you give them the first reading test that they can't do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, they make more than four mistakes on the test, so then you're at this level. Okay, here's the program that goes with that level. Here, here are the other programs we can add. Once you finish this, we can move you into here. And that could be the basics for, for math. And then from there, we can go into reading comprehension, and from there to spelling, and from there to writing. And, and it, they all just basically line up. And as fast as we can get you through them, that's as fast as we're going to go. But you also have to be able to hit the standards. You have to be able to do 60 math facts a minute. Uh, single digit math facts a minute. You have to be able to do 10 analytical deduction conclusions written down on a sheet of paper in one minute. Until, until you can do that, you don't know what you're doing. And then once you have that base, then we can give you books and you read the comprehension and you understand what an analogy is and what a deduction is and what are the rules for deductions and what are the rules for what are considered higher order thinking skills. Well, that's the stuff you do in high school. And they would eat that up. And then we'd give them their, their first course. And every, every one of those courses was 20 lessons long. And they would sit down and do their lesson and submit it. We never marked them. They were marked by the school district. So I'm not responsible for their credit because I just did the teaching. Someone else did the evaluation. So I have no hand in that. And therefore, I know that my guys are good because I didn't give them their A. Someone else did. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so it's all there. It, it, we could map it out for them. Yeah. So is that your, your, the, the Maloney method? Is that what you're alluding to here? Well, that, it, it wasn't at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, that got named the Maloney method later than that, but it was essentially the same thing. You have a whole bunch of different kinds of skills that this person needs in order to be effective. They can't read. They can't write cursively very well. They can't spell worth a damn. They can't do, they, most of them could do math a lot better than, than anything else, okay. but they still can't do algebra. So we would just take them step by step by step through seven or eight math programs, seven or eight reading programs, 
six or seven comprehension programs, and they would have to write lessons and write stories and do all kinds of things to get lots of practice, and off they would go, just off like a rocket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's describe the Maloney method to me. Like, what does that comprise of? Well, it, it's got basically six pieces. Okay. It's got, first of all, behavior objectives, because you need a roadmap. Where are you going? Your, your very last question, how, how do you lay this out? Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, behavioral objectives do that. And they specify a measurement component. Mm -hmm. There's X number per minute on every one of these. I'm not surprised. Sure well, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we know we're accountable and getting it right. Yep. Then there's the... Uh, the behavioral uh, control issue. Sometimes, even with adults, you need a contract to bind them to get there on time, do the work, and you know keep moving. Right? Mm -hmm. Then there's the instructional piece. Well, that's direct instruction, and all those programs have been written for years, and they're all available, mm -hmm. and you know anyone can learn to to teach them if they're trained properly. And then there's the measurement system. So that at the end of the lesson, we know that this student can do this task at this rate with this degree of, of correctness. Well, you, you need to know that before you move them to the next piece, because otherwise they're going to ground, right? Yeah. So again, uh, and then we had what was called, what we do have is what is called uh, monitored practice or directed practice, where I watch you do it to make sure you're not making mistakes. And when I can see that you're halfway to fluency and you're not making many mistakes, I can cut you loose and turn you over into independent practice, which, as any coach knows, is what's going to turn the average player into the star player. You've got to practice your skills and you've got to practice them by yourself and the coach will give you little tips here and there, but by and large, you're good enough to be able to go out there and learn, by, learn the rest by yourself. Mm -hmm. So and then they send them off to school, to, off to college, and away they went. I like that last point because uh, this is like shifting gears a little bit, but um, there's a big thing in behavior analysis where it's like you need reinforcement, you need feedback, this sort of stuff, like the behavioral skills training models, yep. right? Um, this video stuff as an example, I haven't got feedback in that sort of capacity on what I'm doing for each keystroke and the movements and the editing and stuff that I do. Mm -hmm. It's not there, like it's yeah. just not there. and. Uh, I feel like sometimes we get a little too engrossed and ingrained into uh, and dogmatic about like how things need to be going. Well, I think you like need a, data. Yeah. I mean, part of the major problems with our public schools today is that there is no data. Mm -hmm. There's anecdotal data. Or there's some kind of funny number system or whatever, but no parent can make any sense out of what does that really mean my kid can do. Yeah. So consequently, you know, everybody's in the dark. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, you have the behavior analysts that have the blue chart and the dots and the standards, and they say, well, he's at 180 and he needs to be at 200. Well, that's black and white right there. So yeah. what we need to do is to infuse more of that into more systems, mm -hmm. you know, even medical systems. Keeping us, keeping people accountable is scary. They don't like it. Of course, uh, that's, too, well, bite me. <laughs> you know, I mean, if that's your kid on the operating table, do you want me who has been very well trained and very capable, or do you want this guy who kind of thinks he knows what he might think he might do? He's, he's going to do discovery surgery. All right, so now it's your turn. Like, share, subscribe. It actually makes a difference. And if you can, head over to patreon.com backslash the daily BA. The link's down below. Please help support this channel. It's ran and fueled by people just like you. There's over 160 people, and we have a long ways to go to make this sustainable. That's your daily BA.